All right, here we go. Michael Franzese, welcome back. Good to be back. We uh, kicked up a lot of dirt last time. We sure did. Got a lot of uh, got a little responses from it. Uh, most of them quite good, actually. Yeah, I mean, I counted it up. It's like 11 million views combined. That's a lot of views. Uh, how was the reaction from your end? Because the Vlad TV audience, I think, is different than a lot of the other interviews that you did. Reaction was really good, very strong. Um, you know, I, I actually got reactions from all over the world. So I, I don't know how uh, wide you know your audience is, but I, I certainly found out it's pretty wide. Uh, but it was good stuff. You know, I, I was very pleased with the way people responded. Questions were good after that. And, uh, you know, so it worked out well for me. Very cool. Well, I'm glad you came back. Yes. Well, we covered a lot of the story uh, last time, but, but there are some things that we didn't cover that, that I want to discuss with you. Uh, your father, of course, is Sonny Franzis, who was uh, a very high-ranking member in the Colombo crime family. But what I didn't realize was that he's not your biological father? Well, you know, there's been some controversy on that. It, it, it's crazy, Vlad, because for me at this point in time, at this age, to be still wondering you know, what's up, uh, it's kind of crazy. But according to him, he is my biological father. According to others, he's not. You know, I don't know if you know how this kind of came out, but my mom was uh, 16 years old when I was born. Allegedly, my dad had an affair with her um, around that time. And he was married at the time. And my grandparents on my mother's side were pretty upset with what happened. And according to my mother, uh, they forced her to marry someone else so that when she gave birth, uh, she'd be married. Um, when my father divorced his wife at that time, uh, my mom divorced her husband, and then the two of them got married. So uh, my mother revealed this actually in a book that, uh, that was written, Quit Quitting the Mob. She revealed it to my co-author. I didn't even know this. But, you know, the only I can say this, any time it ever came up that I was a stepson, my father was very upset about it. Never wanted to hear that. He legally actually adopted me uh, at an early age. And as far as he's concerned, I'm his biological son. I really don't know. I never did a DNA test. Didn't matter to me. I never really met my, the other person that was supposed to be my father. So um, I can honestly sit here and tell you right now, I really don't know. And honestly, he's the only father I know. So that's how I deal with it. So you never actually met your mother's first husband? No, I did not. Okay. Was he related in, in the mob at all or no? No, he wasn't. He was, uh, from what I know, he was in the military. Uh, I heard later on from other people, he was a very well-liked guy in Brooklyn. But, you know, then I also heard that my father, Sonny, kind of chased him away. So I never seen him, never heard of him. Uh, I don't know. You know, it's, it's crazy to say it at this point in time, but I really don't know the real story. Okay. I mean, because with the DNA testing these days, it's actually pretty easy. All you got to do is get your dad a swab and then you take a swab and then... But I guess you don't care at this point. You know, I don't, look, I'm 68 years old. He's the only father that I know. Um, you know, he's been great to me in that regard in many ways. I know we've had our controversy, you know, after we got into the life and I walked away. But, you know, um, what's it going to prove at this point in time? You know, the other person, is, I know he's dead. Uh, he's not around anymore. So what's it, what does it matter? You know, it really doesn't matter at this point. Now, you said in an interview that there's no such thing as a mafia in America, only in Italy. Can you explain that a little bit? Well, the mafia in Italy is the mafia, and here it's called La Cosa Nostra. And they're similar organizations, obviously, but they're different in many ways also. And if you take an oath to be a member of the mafia in Italy, you're not automatically a member of La Cosa Nostra here, and vice versa, the way I understand. Now, I never tested that. I've never been to Italy and met with anybody over there. But I've certainly met with people from the mafia that came here. And we were courteous to them, respectful. But we didn't share our secrets with them. We were told not to. At least I was. So they're two distinct organizations. You don't, you know, become a member of one and, and are a member of both. Um, and, you know, by virtue of the fact that they're secret organizations, I understand that. And since trust is a big part of it, you know, if you don't really know the people in the mafia in Italy, you're not going to trust them like you know your own here. 
So I just always viewed it as two separate and distinct organizations. Uh, you know, they, they do things kind of differently there, too. You know, the way I understand it and the way I've seen it, you know, in the mafia in Italy, you know, they went after law enforcement. There was times when, you know, in retaliation for certain things, uh, family members were killed. We didn't do that here. We didn't retaliate with law enforcement. That was hands off. Uh, we certainly didn't go after family members. That was a strict code. It's one of the reasons why I never worried about my own family when I walked away from that life. So, you know, we have different policies and different uh, codes there. So I, I view that as a, a very separate distinction between the Mafia and the Cosa Nostra. Now, I've heard different stories about how the word Mafia came around. Do you know the, the origin of that word? You know, I don't go into the, the history of the Mafia back in Italy, but I understand it was... Um, you know, it was more of a protective term against government and against uh, invading uh, people in Italy at that point in time, how a group of people originally band together to protect themselves against, you know, maybe uh, uh, obtrusive government or marauders that were coming into Italy to try to, uh, you know, invade and overtake them. I'm really not a, uh, a historian when it comes to the mafia. I, I heard some story about... Uh... In some town in Italy, like a woman's daughter was raped and she was crying out like mafia, mafia or my daughter and a group of men got together to, to basically kill the guy that, that raped her. And that's kind of how the organization started. I, I don't know whether there's a real story or not. Never really heard that. So I, I, can't, <laughs> I can't comment on it. You have you have the mafia in Italy and then you have the Cosa Nostra in America. Now, when you watch certain movies like, like Goodfellas and so forth, they talk about how you have to be pure Italian to get into the, you know, the, the American mafia. That if you're, if you're mixed, if you're, you know, half Puerto Rican, half white, half whatever, they have to be able to be able to trace your roots back to Italy or Sicily in order to actually accept you. Was that actually true during your time? Yeah, your, your father has to be Italian. Your mom can be of another descent, although it's preferred that both parents are Italian. But the, the qualification is that your father is of Italian origin, and that can be traced back to Italy. And I know when I was, uh, you know, I don't know if you know the process, but when you're, uh, when you're a recruit and your name is submitted uh, to be made at some point, there's actually an investigation that's done. Your name is passed around, at least in New York, to all five families to see if there's any objection for any reason why you shouldn't be, uh, uh, become a made member. So part of that investigation is really to, um, uh, to see your roots. In my case, it, it was pretty easy because of my dad. Um, and that's another reason why I have to believe that he was my father, because that investigation was done on me. And I was traced back to being my father's son. And of course, my father, uh, you know, his origin is, is in Naples, Italy. Okay, is your mother Italian? My mother's Italian also, yes. Okay, but in the mafia, your father has to be Italian. You father can't must have an be Italian, Italian mother and like a Puerto Rican father. That's correct. Your father must be Italian. Okay, and then with the five families, uh, was it called the commission? The, the group, when the group got together, all the bosses got together? Well, you know, the five families are, are in New York. There are other families yeah. throughout the country. And the way I was always told, even though I never experienced this myself, because during my time after Appalachia, as you know, um, as you probably know, um, all of the commission members didn't meet, uh, you know, together because of that Appalachian deal. But there were actually nine families throughout the country. And the way you qualified to be a, a family is that you had to have a boss as become a member of the commission. Then you were recognized as a real family. So, uh, and five of those families were in New York. And New York was really always the stronghold, um, you know, for the mob here in, in America. Right. I'm actually looking it up. The Appalachian Meeting. So it was a historic meeting, uh, historic summit of the American Mafia held uh, at the home of mobster Joe the Barber in Appalachian, New York. Uh, the meeting was held to discuss various topics, including loan sharking, loan sharking narcotics trafficking, gambling. Uh, lo local, lo local and state law enforcement became suspicious 
uh, of the meeting. And I guess what, the meeting was somehow surveilled or, or something like that? Yeah, I think it was accidentally surveilled uh, by two state troopers at the time that happened to catch a license plate of somebody, um, and it led them to this meeting in Appalachia. And after that happened and it was exposed, you know, there were a lot of bosses there and a lot of prominent people here from around the country. Uh, they decided at that point that would never happen again. They would never have a meeting like that again. And to my knowledge, um, I don't think there has been. Now, there's been meetings, obviously, um, between family members uh, from across the country, but never a, a big committee, committee meeting like that ever again. Well, yeah, I'm looking it up. More than 60 underworld bosses were detained. Correct. 60 bosses were, well, not necessarily arrested, but detained all in one place. That's correct. So was, someone, someone basically just hit the jackpot on that. On and and, it, that and it, was accident. it was an accident that they hit the jackpot. But they did, and like I said, as a result, they would never have a, a meeting like that again. Okay. Now, your father was known as the, one of the enforcers or the main enforcer for the Colombo family? Uh, well, that's what the, uh, you know, the media and law enforcement dubbed him as back in the, uh, the 50s and 60s. You know, I, I got to tell you, Vlad, you know, that was obviously I was around during the 50s and 60s. And I always wondered, you know, my father was a prominent guy in that life. There was no doubt about it. But he got so much media attention. You know, he wasn't the only guy around. I mean, that was when Carlo Gambino was around and Anastasia was around and Colombo was around and so many guys were around at that time. And I always wondered why it was him that they really selected to go after in such a, a, a hostile way. I mean, you know, my dad was the John Gotti of his day. As a matter of fact, I believe he got more attention at his time than Gotti did. And we didn't have social media, obviously, back then. But the media coverage he got was just, it was unheard of to that point. I mean, nobody had gotten that. And I always wondered why. And I always said to him, Dad, you know, why you? And, you know, he gave me some different answers for it. So, I mean, I think law enforcement believed that. Look, law enforcement said he was responsible for 30 or 40 or 50 murders. Now, they never proved that. We've never seen any evidence of that. Uh, nobody's ever come out and said, well, Sonny Franzese killed all of these people. It was just their theory at the time. But theory almost became fact. But... Uh, we have no evidence to prove that, but somehow they believed it. Like, how many people was your dad accused of killing? Uh, formally, one. Yeah. Only one. He went to trial for uh, the alleged, um, he ordered the murder of a guy by the name Ernie the Hawk Rapolo, who was a uh, associate, you know, of the family. And he went to trial and he was acquitted. He was found not guilty. That was the only murder that my dad was ever formally accused of committing or ordering even, not even that he personally committed it. How many people was he rumored to have killed? Oh, I, I, I've read 30, 40, 50, you know, I mean, I, all these crazy numbers. But they never give names of any of them. They just said that he was rumored to kill or supposedly killed all these people. But there's no evidence and nobody's ever said anything. Right. Well, and at one point, your dad actually okay to hit on you. We talked about this last time. Well, look, that's what the FBI told me. Um, you know, they, they came in and said, your father went along with the murder. Not that he ordered it. Persico ordered it, and he went along with it. Uh, my father denies that to me, obviously. You know, I've confronted him on it. Uh, he denied it. He said it wasn't true. Uh, but the FBI said they had word from their informants. So, you know, who knows? To me, uh, you know, there could be some truth to it because I know my dad and I know that he is a, you know, true soldier of this life, or at least he was. And, uh, you know, allegedly I did the wrong thing at this point in time. So, you know, I, I, I'm sure. I, look, I'll be honest with you. I don't know that my dad would have ever pulled the trigger on me. I'm not saying that. But did he say, well, look, if my son did the wrong thing, then I have to go along with it? Very possible. What would you have done in a situation like that when, let's just say, when you were really active and your child was about to testify against you and give you and everyone around you life in prison? What would you have done to your child? I would have never, ever pulled the trigger on my own son. I have two boys, could have never done that in a million years. I would have said, you know what? This is just, uh, this is, I'm a product of this life, and if this way it's got to go, and this is the way it's going to happen, it's going to happen. 
I could have never done that. I would have never turned against my, my children in that way. I just couldn't do it. You know, it's not in me to do it. You know, Vlad, I'll say this. Look, there were guys in that life that I don't want to, I can't get inside their head and I can't say that they enjoyed violent acts or they enjoyed committing murders. Um, but they seemed a little bit more into it. Let's put it that way. You know, me, when I had to do certain things, I wasn't comfortable with it. It was just who I was inside. I wasn't comfortable. I can't say I enjoyed it. I did it anyway because I followed orders and I did what I had to do. But it wasn't something that, uh, that I was really cut out for. It wasn't what I wanted to do. So again, I'm not getting it in his, inside anybody's head. I'm not getting into my father's head. But I could have never done that to any, either one of my children. Well, you never had a, a child try to testify against you, but we talked about this last time. Your brother actually testified against your father and ended up getting him how many years? He got an eight-year sentence on that. Well, eight actually, years at like actually, at like 90-something years old? He, he was uh, 95 and 96 at the time. Actually, you know, the word is out that my, my dad actually gave information against my father twice that he got him violated on his parole at one time. We didn't know that, you know, so it went way back. It went even before he testified against him in trial. So I don't know how long my brother was providing information, but it seemed to be beyond even the time that he testified against him. So it happened twice. Right, and your brother was a drug addict. He, he had a severe drug problem for most of his life, yes. What was he hooked on? Uh, you know, I think it was cocaine, really, mostly coke. Okay. And now your brother is actually in witness protection. He, uh, he's been in witness protection. I think he came out of witness protection earlier this year. Um, you know, he actually did an article, or he did an interview, rather, for uh, um, uh, a major publication in Indianapolis. You can look that up. He's also uh, was interviewed by people at Newsday, you know, in New York, and uh, he gave an interview. So he's come out of it. I think he's living outside of the program. I don't know exactly where he is right now. I don't really want to know. Um, but that's the latest. Have you had a conversation with your father about how he feels about your brother? I have, yeah. And, and what did he say? Well, obviously, he was stunned by it. He was very upset by what happened with my brother. He never said to me that, you know, we got to go after your brother, or I, or I ordered your brother's killing, or I went along with it. He never said that. I heard he said that to others, and obviously that's been in the newspaper, and that's what the FBI alleged. He never said that to me personally. But uh, I know he was very upset about it, obviously. Also, the FBI was saying that your dad potentially ordered a hit on his other son. That's correct. Over, over testifying against him. That, that's what I read, and that's what was reported, yes. If your brother walks in the room right now and sits down next to you, what would happen? You know, I mean, I would embrace him. I, I told him, look, I've had conversation with my brother, and I told him straight out, I don't agree with what you did. I think it was horrible. Um, I even believe that you lied on the witness stand. Because for me, Vlad, I've never seen an informant of any kind get on a witness stand put their left hand on a Bible, right hand, swear to tell the truth, uh, the whole truth, and then lie through their teeth. And I was in the courtroom when my brother testified, and he wasn't truthful about everything he said. And I've told him that, you know, but, uh, I mean, I wouldn't kill him. I, I certainly wouldn't. Uh, he's still my brother. I love him. I just don't agree with what he did. And uh, it's hard to trust him, you know. But, look, I've, I've had recent conversations with him, and I think my brother has, has turned kind of a corner in his life. I think... He regrets somewhat what he did, and I think he's trying to do the right thing right now, but, you know, who knows? Well, you talked about how the most violent acts that you did was over your brother and your sister, you know, rest in peace, uh, doing drugs, and you, I guess, trying to get involved in between those situations. Can you talk about that? Well, look, you know, more so my sister than my brother. Um, she was my baby sister, my younger sister. And, you know, it was very difficult when I saw her in places where, you know, guys were taking advantage of her, you know, feeding her drugs and taking advantage of her. And, you know, I acted out at that point. And, um, you know, really with my sister, not, not my brother as much, but... Um, 
Do I regret it? Look, I, I was angry at the time. You know, I, I think anybody that's, uh, you know, putting drugs in your sister's arm and, and abusing her, I think that would be, cause anybody to lash out. And, you know, me, I have a temper and, you know, I was a product of that life. And as a result, I acted in that way. And obviously, I'm not going to get into detail about it. But, um, you know, when I look back, uh, I did some tough things as a result of that. Yes. So, I mean, the way you described it, she was on heroin? You know, I don't know what they were shooting in Haram, but it looked like heroin to me. And, you know, she was certainly on coke. I know that. And, um, you know, she really struggled with that for quite some time. Uh, you know, one of the reasons I, I'm against marijuana, you know, and I'm not going to get into the medicinal value of it and so on and so forth, because I believe that both my brother and sister started, you know, by smoking pot. And my brother might deny it. I don't know. But uh, my sister, you know, confided in me that she did. She was smoking pot in an early age. And then she advanced to other drugs. Now, I know it doesn't have to be a gateway drug. I know other people can smoke it. I know people that smoke it now, and they've never gone on to other drugs. But it certainly can be. And as a result of that, I've always been against it. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, I did some rough things as a result of seeing my sister in that situation, who I love dearly. And as a result, you know, she died of an overdose. So uh, that's very hard to accept. Uh, how old was she when she died? 27. Oh, wow. She was so young. Yeah, and she had just, you know, she came out to California and she kind of straightened her life out. She was living with me and my wife was, uh, was really a, uh, a great influence on her, so were my kids. And she was doing well for several months. And then all of a sudden she left and went back east and I don't know what happened. I don't know how it happened. I know she died in a hotel room in Florida. Uh, you know, because of my situation at the time, I couldn't even go to the funeral. It was terrible at that point. But... Uh, you know, a very sad situation. But, you know, Vlad, I'll tell you this. You know, my family was destroyed as a result of my dad's involvement in that life. And, you know, my sister dies of an overdose of drugs. My brother, a drug addict most of his life, uh, turns into an informant. My mother, 33 years without a husband. When she passed on, uh, you know, in 2012, her relationship with my dad was terrible because she blamed him for everything that went wrong in our lives. My younger sister died of, uh, you know, of cancer at a young age. She was 42 years old. I mean, all of this stuff is just a product of what I believe, you know, my dad's involvement in that life caused. And I don't know any family of any member of that life that in some way hasn't been devastated. So as a result, you know, I said, this is a bad lifestyle. It's not conducive to good family lights. It breaks up families. I tell these gangbangers the same thing. You know, you're going to put all this on your family because of your involvement in the street life. So, you know, one of the reasons I walked away was to preserve my family from going through exactly that. And fortunately, up to this point, I have been able to do that. So uh, it was just, it was a tough upbringing. It really was. Did you personally know uh, Ori Spado? I did know Ori, yes. Didn't like him. Okay. There was a, an interview I, I saw recently on the Gangster Chronicles, and... He knew your father, uh, I guess, very well. That's and correct. And he said at one point your father actually put a hit out on him. Do you know about this? Put a hit out on Ori? Yeah. No, I don't know that to be a fact, but uh, Ori's a bad guy. I mean, Ori used my father's name, used my name, threatened people as a result of that. Uh, he was doing some illicit things with my brother. I think he was feeding my brother drugs. I think when my brother finally straightened out a little bit when he was living with me out here, you know, in the early 2000s, I think Ori put him back on drugs. I don't like Ori Spado, and uh, he won't come near me, regardless of what he might have said in that interview. I don't, I, I don't, I'm not aware of the interview, so I don't know if he said anything uh, about anything, but he's a liar. Uh, I wouldn't believe anything that he says. Um, you know, I, I know, uh, I believe he was going to be one of the witnesses against my dad. I think he turned informant. Uh, that's what I heard. I don't know that for a fact, but uh, he never did come in to testify, so I don't know. Yeah, I'll send you a link to the interview, uh, you know, after after we're done. But he claims that your dad put a, a hit out on him over some situation. But later on, the two of them worked it out, and he claims that him and your dad still talk like once a week or once every couple of weeks, and they're friends now. I don't know if that's true or not, but well, you know what? that's what he said. Uh, I, I would hope not. Uh, but my dad has a tendency, I, I don't know, you know, something. Look, my dad's 102 years old. 
he may not even know who he's talking to at the other end of the phone, but I don't think Ori goes in to visit him, you know. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know about that. Um, to me, Ori, Ori is not truthful at all. I don't believe anything he says, so I would take that with a grain of salt. I mean, in that type of life, because there is so much violence and there is so much lying and trickery and prison and, and murder and, and this and that, do people kind of get in the mindset of forgiveness because otherwise they would just kind of hate everyone around them? You know, you, you forgave your father for allegedly allowing a hit on you. Do you see that type of thing in general in that life? Well, you know, when you're in that life, it's uh, depending upon what you might hear from somebody, you know, forgiveness could be dangerous. <laughs> you know, you, you have to act to protect yourself in that life if you think something or somebody is, is trying to undermine you or go against you. So uh, forgiveness in that life, depending upon the situation, could be dangerous to you. Um, you know, even if you want to forgive somebody, you may not be able to forgive somebody because you don't know what their, their ultimate motive or intention is. You don't know if they're, you know, collaborating with somebody else against you. I mean, you know, you, you got to walk a line in that life all the time. You got to be, you know, constantly aware of your surroundings, the people that you're talking to, who they might be talking to. Uh, so you might forgive somebody inwardly, but you might not be able to act on that forgiveness openly. Now, you had mentioned that at one point, if you dealt drugs and you were in the mafia, you would get killed. Uh, was that, you know, just for a certain amount of time? Because the mafia definitely was involved in drugs at various, various different times. You know, the night that I was straightened out, Halloween night, 1975, I was told straight out, if we dealt with drugs, we'd die. And... Throughout my tenure in that life, that's what I was told. We were never allowed to get involved with drugs. And I remember one time somebody approached me with, uh, they had three truckloads of, of uh, pot, marijuana. And they, they asked me to move it for them. They said, look, we'll give it you at a discount price, bring it forward. I wasn't interested, but since somebody came to me, I wanted to make sure that I wasn't being trapped. So I went and I put it on record with my boss at the time. And I said, look, I'm not interested in this, but somebody brought it to me. And before anybody hears anything differently, I'm bringing it to you. I'm not interested. I'm not going to do anything with it. Uh, but I'm just letting you know it's available. And I was told at that point in time, straight out, we're not getting involved in it. Just chase the guy away. Don't get involved. So, and that was, uh, that was in the early 80s. So, you know, up till my time that I left that life, there was no involvement with drugs, at least with our family. Now, I knew that other guys were doing it, but I knew they were doing it undercover. They weren't doing it out in the open. And if you asked them about it, they denied it. So. Right. But in the earlier times, during like the, the you know, the Gigante era and so forth, they were dealing a lot of drugs, right? during like the, the 60s and 70s? You know, I'm watching, uh, I just watched the series, The Godfather of Harlem, and I'm seeing, right. look, 90% of that with, with Chin is not true. I mean, all the stories that they're making up. Now, I'm not, no, it was, it was a good series. It was well acted and so on and so forth. It was good. Um, but it was not truthful at all. Not at all. And I, I don't believe that Chin was involved to that extent that they're showing in that series. And I certainly know that uh, Joe Bonanno was involved to that extent. I mean, it was, it was you know, uh, shortly after that that he was, uh, you know, dispelled out to Arizona. So there was a lot that's made up there, and it's going to lead people to believe that we were major drug traffickers at the time. I don't believe a lot of that was true. As a matter of fact, I know for a fact a lot of it wasn't true. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't know where that's going to lead in people's minds. Okay, but you actually knew Chin Gigante. I did. Okay, so what kind of person was he? Well, you know, Chin was a guy that he didn't care who you were, you know, what position you had in that life. If he didn't want to meet up with you, he wouldn't. He happened to like my father, I heard. And I was very close with a guy by the name of Freddy, Fritzy Givinelli, who was under Chin. And he said Chin wanted to meet me, and I went to see Chin one day. Uh, I met him on a couple of occasions. We walked down Houston Street, and he was in his bathrobe and unshaven and so on and so forth. 
but we had good conversation. And what the conversation was for me at that time, he had heard that, um, you know, that I was getting some trouble because of my involvement in the gas business and, you know, people were looking at me in different ways. Thought I might have, I might have a problem with Persico, my boss at the time. And he said to me straight out, he didn't like Junior, and he said to me straight out, if you ever want to come and be with me, you can be with me. I'll work it out. I'll move you to my family. He said, that's an open offer to you. And I said, Chin, thank you very much, and I appreciate it, you know, and uh, uh, if I ever need that assistance, I'll come back to you. But it wasn't something that I was going to do. So with me, he was good. He was very lucid. You know, he wasn't crazy in any which way. Um, you know, so I had a good relationship with him. Does that ever happen that one, a person goes from one crime family to another officially? It's very rare, but it does happen, yes. It can happen. Huh. What's usually the situation around that? Well, you know, maybe there's a problem in one family and, uh, you know, you, you go to the other guy for help and then he officially moves you over. They work it out. Um, you know, in Chin's case, Chin was the most powerful guy in New York City at that point. So if he wanted something, uh, most of the time he was going to get it. So I, I think he would have moved me over from Persico if, if I wanted to go. And uh, it's happened in the past. I mean, I, one or two occasions that I've heard. So, yeah, it's not unheard of. Okay. And in the show Godfather of Harlem, which, which by the way, is a great show, like yeah. you said, you sort of see the whole crazy, you know, the, you know, like the in the shower with the umbrella and he talks about how he's acting crazy because he'd rather go to an asylum than to prison and the feds were already on him. So you're talking about when you met up with him, he was acting, he had the crazy act right along with you in the middle of Houston Street. That's correct. You know, look, people have asked me all the time, do you think he was crazy? And I said, look, he wasn't crazy. But to act crazy and get away with it for that many years, you've got to have a little something inside of you to do it. But, you know, look, Chin protected himself. I mean, it wasn't until very late in the game that Chin went off to jail when, you know, the racketeering laws and everything just caught up with him. But Chin didn't go to prison because he was very protective of who he met. It wasn't so much the crazy act. To me, it was more the way he conducted himself. Like I said, he didn't care who you are or who you were. If he didn't want to meet with you, he wouldn't. And he was very guarded as to who he would meet, who he would talk to. Uh, he never really got caught on wiretaps or, uh, you know, with informants around him, with bugging devices. So he was very careful the way he needed to be about how he acted. You know, the crazy thing, in the end, it didn't work. So, you know, he might have acted that way for a long time, but I think it was more the way he positioned himself in that life that kept him out of trouble for so long. Right. I'm actually looking at his Wikipedia page now, and... When you look at his nicknames, you know, of course, you have the Chin, but then you have the Odd Father, right? The the Enigma in the bathrobe, and the Robe. <laughs> so I guess the bathrobe was a real big recurring kind of theme with this guy. Yeah, well, he used to walk Houston Street in his bathrobe, unshaven, with his hair all messed up. I mean, that's how I walked with him. You know, uh, it, it was funny to me. It was, uh, you know, it was it was unique. But let's put it that way. I never saw anybody pull that off before. But uh, in my conversations with him, and, and we had you know a few meetings like that. In my conversations with him, he was uh, very bright, very lucid, and a, a smart guy. I respected him a lot. I really did. And for for people that haven't been to New York. Houston Street is like a major commercial street. Yeah, major. One of the major streets in, in Manhattan. This is not like a little side street in a little Italy somewhere where you could walk down a bathrobe and it's not a big deal. You're there with a bunch of major stores and traffic going back and forth. So you're, you're attracting a lot of attention if you're on Houston Street in a bathrobe. That's correct. And I'm sure he did that purposely uh, so that whatever photographs were being taken of him at the time, uh, that's how they saw him. In The Godfather of Harlem, the... The five families were dealing with the black gangs uh, in Harlem, which at the time was was Bumpy Johnson. Later on, it became Frank Lucas. Right. Uh, and then after Frank Lucas, um, who were the other guys? Who, who's the guy in the in the fur um, who ended up telling on everybody? Well, Frank Lucas did become an informant. I, I think you know that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, he he actually. I think he originally drew a 70-year prison sentence, 
and he got it reduced to five years after he agreed to inform. So I don't know of anybody after him that was the informant, but Frank, uh, without a doubt, I mean, that's, that's a matter of record. He was an informant. Were you guys dealing with any of the black criminal figures in New York during that time, or not so much? Well, not as much, no. You know, I, I certainly wasn't. We, look, we had, we had black associates and friends, you know. I always got along very well with, with all the black guys, even in prison. Uh, for some reason, um, you know, but, you know, I can't say that we were specifically doing business with them. At least I don't know of any anyone at that time that we were specifically doing business with. Um, trying to think, you know, legitimately, like in the record business, I was dealing with Al Sharpton quite a bit. You know, I dealt with uh, uh, with another fellow. Now I, I can't think of his name that introduced me to uh, uh, two people that I, that uh, eventually became, I eventually found out they were undercover cops uh, and FBI agents. But, um, you know, we dealt with, with blacks quite a bit. Um, you know, we had everybody in the music business through Norby Walters. You know, I knew Marvin Gaye back then and, and Dionne Warwick and all those people. So we had relationships and they were always good, always good. Uh, Nicky Barnes was the name I was trying oh, to Oh, yeah, find. Nicky Barnes. Okay, yeah. Okay, you ever dealt with him? Uh, I did not, no. Certainly heard of him quite a bit during that time, but never dealt with him. Yeah, he ended up uh, testifying against everybody, I believe. That's correct. So it was both him and Frank Luke, Lucas that, uh, that became informants. And Frank Lucas, we interviewed him. Uh, you know, he had a relationship with, with um, Bumpy Johnson. He was, I guess, his driver at one point. And I guess he ended up testifying against a bunch of dirty cops as well. I don't know if he testified against other people as well, but is that considered a no-no, testifying against cops? Testifying against anybody is considered a no-no. I mean, we're not supposed to do that, um, you know, at least in our life. You know, we're not supposed to give information or testify at any point in time against anybody. That's what we're told. Um, obviously, it wouldn't be looked at as poorly as if you testified against one of your own. Um, but uh, we're not supposed to do that. Gotcha. Now, before you were actually made a, a made man, you had a situation with uh, pa Paul uh, Castellano? Yes. Am I pronouncing it correctly? That's correct, yes. Okay. And uh, Paul Castellano, well, he was known as the Howard Hughes, the Howard Hughes of the mob. Why was he given that name? Because of his business acumen. He was a very wealthy guy, and he was, uh, you know, allegedly more legitimate than he was, you know, a street guy, more of a legitimate guy and a businessman. And, uh, you know, so they viewed him in that way, and not necessarily favorably. I, I didn't hear a lot of good things about Paul Castellano during my time before he got murdered. Um, and, you know, my one encounter with him that was, you know, a problem, you know, I, I didn't care for him too much either, but, you know, that was my opinion. Right, and he was the head of the Gambino crime family, and I guess at the time that was the most powerful family? Yeah, Gambino, Genovese, you know, they were the biggest families, so people looked at them as being the most powerful families, but, you know, that's that's subjective, you know, if you ask Persico, we were the most powerful, but, you know, the Gambino and the Genovese, by the numbers, uh, w were bigger than us, and, and therefore they might have had more power than us. Okay, and you had a situation over some chicken uh, with Paul. That's correct. Uh, can you describe that? Yeah, I had a market uh, out in Long Island, and, you know, it was one of those markets that had a butcher shop and a seafood and fruits and vegetables. And uh, we were told that we had to buy our chicken. Paulie was in the chicken business. I think Frank, Far Frank Pardue was his partner. So we had to buy our chicken and our poultry from Paul. So I, I had a big order. It was a Memorial Day weekend. We bought a big order from him, and somebody came in, and uh, we sold him a big order for the Memorial Day weekend. Well, the day after, on a Tuesday, they came back and said they couldn't use any of the chickens because they had maggots in them. They were bad. So I called up uh, Paul's guy at that time, who I didn't know was a made guy, and I said, we're, uh, we're returning the chickens and I'm not paying you for them. And he started 
cussed me out on the phone. He said, no, you're paying for them. I said, no, we're not. I said, you know, we had them in the fridge, refrigerator one day. They couldn't have gone bad. I'm not paying you. So he started cursing me out. I started cursing him out back. You know, we went this big fight on the phone, you know. And I said, I'm not paying you. Come and pick them up or I'll throw them in the garbage. And, you know, the next morning I get a call from my captain at the time and said, get into Brooklyn right away. So I go into Brooklyn and he tells me, what was this conversation you had with uh, Paulie's guy on the phone? He said he was a made guy. You cursed him out. I said, well, he cursed me out. I didn't know who he was. So he said, well, Paulie's very upset and you're going to have to buy back the chickens. I said, I, why would I buy them? I said, they were bad chickens. You know, <laughs> this was, uh, it was over chickens, right? So we actually had a sit down with Paul. I mean, he was really upset about this and his guy. And I was told and my boss was there. So because Paulie was a boss, I had to have a boss at the time, Tom, Tom DeBella and Andrew Russo. They were my two guys. So, uh, I mean, he was really upset with me. You cursed my guy out. I said, well, I didn't know who he was. You know, I'm sorry. I didn't know that he was, uh, you're only a recruit. Who are you to talk like that to a made guy? I said, Paulie, I'm telling you, I didn't know he was a made guy. I don't know who he is. He was on the other end of the phone. Back and forth, back and forth. And the way the decision came down afterwards is I didn't have to pay for the chickens, but I had to continue using Paulie as my supplier. So that's how it worked out. But uh, I mean, he was very, very upset with me. You know, he called me all sorts of names and so on and so forth. And, you know, after it was all over, when we drove away, uh, my boss and, uh, and my captain, they started laughing about it. They said, this is the biggest deal we ever had over chickens in our life. And, you know, it, it turned out to be a joke with us, but uh, it was serious at the moment, let me tell you, because he was upset. So for a guy to get that upset over a couple of hundred bucks, because that's really all it was, uh, you can tell that money was uh, very important to him. Well, why would a boss meet with a recruit of another family? Wouldn't that be handled on a more higher level? Well, yeah, but my boss was there too. I mean, this became a major sit down basically because number one, I refused to pay. And number two, I was disrespectful to another mob guy, uh, a maid guy, I should say, who was related to Paulie at the time, was his nephew or his cousin, I don't know who he was. But uh, so I was disrespectful to a maid guy, plus I refused to pay. So those were two major things at that point in time. Why Paulie had to come and get involved in this? Again, you're right. I, I agree with you. Instead of just saying it's a couple of hundred dollars handle it or whatever, this went up to that level where my boss and the boss of the Gambino family had to get involved in a major sit down over a couple of hundred dollars worth of chickens and might be in disrespectful on the other end of the phone to another made guy. That was that big a deal he made out of it. Was there a chance that you could have gotten killed in that meeting? You know, I don't know if it went that far, but it might have been that they would have stripped me of my ability to get made because I was disrespectful. Yeah, I mean, it, it could have went that far. But my guy stood up for me in a big way. Honestly, I was right. I mean, I wasn't wrong. You sell me chickens that I can't resell because they got maggots in them. I only had them in my refrigerator one day, so it couldn't have been my fault. You know, and then you start cursing me out on the other end of the phone. I mean, I was right in that argument. So... Uh, they went to bat for me in a big way and we resolved it. But yeah, I mean, they could have at least, you know, stripped me of my ability to become a made guy. They could have done that. Well, we got your book, uh, I'll Make You an Offer You Can't Refuse, Insider Business Tips from a Former Mob Boss. And in the book, you talked about sit downs. You, you explained the difference between a sit down and a traditional company meeting. And uh, there are certain rules uh, in this. Let me go ahead and just pull it up real quick. Um, number one, always come to a sit down with both barrels loaded. Remind yourself to lead with your brain rather than your mouth at all times. Leave your ego at the door when you go to a sit down. Never act like you're the weakest link in the deal and keep your cool and be respectful at all times. What is the, the two barrels loaded? What does that mean? Well, for me, it meant this you got to know exactly what you're trying to get out of the sit down, what you're trying to win. And you got to know exactly what your opponent at that point in time, you got to know his personality. Uh, you got to know what he's going to try to get out of it. Um, so you got to be well prepared. You can't just go in there not knowing what it is you want to accomplish. You also got to know what you're going to settle for. Because if you lose, you know, you have to at least get a, a backup position so that you know you can settle for something. And then you got to try to uh, skillfully maneuver into that position. 
So I hope I'm explaining it right, because there are rules in a sit down. For instance, I could be sitting across the table from another made guy, and I know he can be lying through his teeth. I can't call him a liar. I have to outmaneuver him and outsmart him so that you could see at the table that he's lying or that, he, or that he's not telling the truth in some way. But I can't call him a liar. I can't lose my temper with him. I can't get upset, you know, to the point where, you know, I'm angry. I'm going to get up and walk away. You have to keep your cool. So um, basically, when you come into a sit down, you got to be very well prepared and you got to know how to maneuver your position. Because if I were to call somebody a liar, another made guy, I automatically lose. I'm done. Finished. So there's certain things you just can't do. You got to abide by. Um, and in these sit downs, everything is decided in a sit down. Everything. I mean, whether it be life or death, whether it be a business deal, everything is decided. So you have to know, know how to skillfully nav navigate yourself through one of those meetings. Right. You talked about how certain sit downs, there's plastic on the floor already. Well, you know, listen, uh, you know, that's symbolic. It's not that somebody's going to die at the sit down, but um, if it's a sit down over you know, something as serious as a life or death situation with somebody. Um, yeah, it could be decided right then and there. So you got made in 1975. Correct. There was five other guys that were made along with you. Correct. All five of them were murdered. Correct. Over various times. Yes. And I guess a war had broken out at some point? Yes. We had, we had a war in our family, uh, 91 to 94, 95. Okay, what was that war over? Leadership, you know, power. Um, a fellow by the name of uh, Victor Arena, who was the acting boss for Persico at the time when Persico went into prison. The deal between them was that Arena would be acting boss until Junior's son, Ali Boy Persico, who actually was my gumbada, he baptized my older boy. Uh, when he came home from prison, Arena was supposed to give up the, uh, the spot to Alley Boy. Well, when Alley Boy came home, Arena decided that he didn't want to give it up, that he wanted to stay as the boss, and the families went to war. And it was the Arena faction against the Persico faction. And they just started killing each other? Yeah, they did. And you were close to all these guys? Very close. That was my family. Okay. What side were you on? Persico side. Uh, yeah, I, that's I, the side uh, who ultimately won? Yes, ultimately won. Um, a lot of guys got killed. I think 12, 13 guys were killed during that time. A um, bunch of guys went to prison as a result. Arena got 300 years uh, for various murders he ordered or allegedly ordered. And a whole bunch of guys got went away. Okay, so you were on the Persico side. So yes. the, arena, uh, the arena guys, were they trying to kill you? Were there any attempts on your life during that time? Well, there were attempts on my life already because I had walked away and uh, they were already trying to kill me. Actually, it was the Persico side that put the hit out on me. But I, I actually wasn't a fan of arenas. I'll, I'll tell you what happened. When um, uh, I had taken my plea or was about to take my plea on this big racketeering case for all that gas stuff, I was in uh, MDC, in the uh, jail with uh, Persico in Manhattan at the time. And he was locked up on this whole Giuliani case, you know, the whole mob commission case. And Persico had come over to me and he said, look, um, you know, I'm gonna make him my acting boss while I'm away. And when uh, Ali Boy comes home, you're gonna give it up to him because Ali was in jail. He was doing a 12 year prison sentence. And I said, Junior, I can't do that. I'm taking a plea. I'm going to go to jail myself, so I'm taking a 10-year plea. I'd already negotiated it. And he said, well, in that case, I'm going to give it to Arena. And I looked at him, and I said, you know, Junior, you're making a mistake. He said, no, 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 I can control him. I, I can trust him. And I knew Vic differently, and a lot of guys knew Vic Arena differently. I said, you're making a mistake, but, you know, you're the boss. You do what you want. And he did give him that position, and as a result, Arena turned against him, and the families went to war. So um, I wasn't a big fan of Vic's. You know, he was actually with my father. He was first with us. I knew him since I was a kid. And uh, a lot of guys didn't trust him. And uh, I was one of them that didn't. 
because I knew that he used to try to undermine. He actually tried to undermine me with John Gotti in the gas business. I had a big sit down with him. I won the sit down, but he tried to come against me. He wanted a piece of the gas business with Gotti and I wouldn't let him have it. Well, you mentioned Giuliani and Giuliani personally went after you at one point. Yes. And I guess he threatened to give you 100 years, which was twice the number of years that he gave your father. That's correct. Or, or try to give your father. Correct. Well, no, no, no. Let, let, me, let me be clear. Giuliani never uh, indicted my dad. My dad had already gotten 50 years early on. But what he, Giuliani told me is that if he convicted me on the case, he was going to give me double what my father got, 100 years. Got it. And um, I was acquitted in that case. Okay. How much interaction did you personally have with Giuliani? Not outside much. Of that conversation? It was just uh, one conversation. Uh, it was very brief. And he didn't preside over the trial. He did come into the courtroom on occasion. Uh, but uh, he had two of his assistants that prosecuted us. And um, so that was it. It was my only encounter. Okay. And Giuliani really went after the mafia hard in New York. Yes. And, you know, we talked about how in Italy they would kill cops and, you know, politicians and that type of thing. But that was frowned upon in America. But you said at one point you guys were actually considering killing Giuliani. The conversation was brought up, yes. And uh, it was brought up by Persico. And um, there were two people that normally you'd, you'd have hands off on that I knew there was conversations about uh, taking them out. One was Giuliani, and the other was Geraldo Rivera. Um, he just wasn't liked on the street. <laughs> And, uh, you know, there was talk about taking him out at one point. Now, I, mean, I told Geraldo this. Uh, he got scared when I told him, too. But um, it was later on, later on. But, yeah, there was talk about taking Giuliani out. I mean, Giuliani getting murdered by the mafia would have really just unraveled the whole system. Everyone would have went to prison. Because it's interesting. I had a guy on my show recently named Brian Glaze Gibbs. He was a, a gangster uh, from Brooklyn, but he ended up being like the enforcer for Fat Cat, uh, who was the biggest you know black drug dealer out there in Queens. One of the guys in Fat Cat's crew, a guy named by the name of Pappy Mason, he ordered uh, the murder of a rookie cop named Edward Byrne. Do you remember this whole situation? I remember hearing about that. Yes. Edward Byrne was a rookie cop who was stationed in Queens on a drug block because this, uh, this uh, Guyanese immigrant was always calling to complain about the drug dealers on his block. So right. they, they put a cop car in front of his, his house. And this guy, Pappy Mason, ordered the execution of this like 22-year-old rookie cop. And that became the face of the war on drugs. There are some guys in Queens that are making a lot of money. Hmm? Pappy Mason and Lorenzo Fat Cat Nichols. Yeah. Now, were they in the same crew together? Cat was the man. Cat was okay, the big, so Cat was the Cat, big, Cat was the was the main guy Cat and the, Pappy w yeah. w worked for him? Yeah, Pappy had his own shit. Um Cat is a chess player. Uh in fact, when George H.W. Bush was running for president, he had the badge of Edward Byrne that he would bring up in his rallies. Yes. So that's what happens in America when, like, a cop gets executed. Now, Giuliani at the time, was he the mayor or just a prosecutor? No, he was a pro. He was a U.S. attorney in Manhattan. Okay. What would have happened if Giuliani was murdered? All hell would have broke loose, and that's why, you know, we, it was always hands off. You didn't go after law enforcement. You didn't go after politicians for that very reason, because we knew at that point in time the entire, you know, strength of the, of the federal government, for sure, the Justice Department, would have come down on us. And so we avoided it. You know, our thinking all the time, especially the old timers, we had to be as um, low-key and undercover as we possibly could. You know, that's one of the reasons why there was some disdain for John Gotti, because John was out there so much and people criticized that. The old timers always believed we have to be as low-key. We don't even exist. You know, we're, we're as low-key as possible. And uh, they tried to maintain that. And for a long time, it worked. You know, it really worked. Because we had so much power in this country for such a long time. But 
you know, we weren't exposed in a way that you might think. Yeah, they dragged us in front of grand juries and so on and so forth, but nothing really came of it. You know, and when guys went to prison, they went to prison for a couple of years, came back out and started all over again. So, you know, when uh, this new technology and these new laws that came out and guys, you know, kind of being, you know, out there, look, myself included, I mean, I had a lot of publicity too. It didn't help, doesn't help. You know, it only puts this bullseye on your back. So you don't want to ever go after law enforcement and bring the entire wrath of the Justice Department down on you and every police force that, you know, locally is watching you too. So, you know, it was a good policy. Just beat them in court, stay low key, and take care of our own. If we have an informant, we'll take care of that guy because he's one of ours. But you leave law enforcement alone. Well, you fast forward to 2019, and now Giuliani is Trump's main lawyer. Right. Uh, did you deal with Trump at all? <laughs> you know, I, 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 Trump probably won't even remember, but I met him with uh, Roy Cohen. You know, we met at, uh, I forget the club, that was a private club that Roy used to go to. I met Donald and we said hello, we exchanged niceties and so on and so forth. And way back when, you know, myself and, uh, and David Bogatin, who was one of my Russian associates, we bought, uh, you know, condos in Trump Towers, you know, when it was being built or way back at the time, early 80s. So, uh, you know, I had that kind of an encounter with him. But, you know, let, let me get this out right away. You know, Trump was not associated with the mob. You know, he's not, didn't have relationships. Trump was a developer in New York, and any developer in New York had to deal with mob guys or mob associates because they dealt with the unions, and every union was mobbed up. Every union, every local, every union. So in order to get things done, you had to deal with us in some way, shape, or form. Didn't mean that you were part of our life. We didn't go out to socialize and have dinner. We did with some. Jerry Gutterman was one of them, big developer that I you know, had a lot of relationships with. He eventually went to jail, but, you know, I worked personally with him. But Donna wasn't one of those guys. So the Teamsters were essentially run by the mob? At that time, yes. And uh, Jimmy Hoffa was a close associate with the mob as well. He was. Uh, and that's how you guys kind of got in that whole situation. And the Teamsters were a huge union. It was all the truck drivers and everything, right? That's correct. And so you guys control the unions. You also control the docks? That's correct. Okay. So you guys really had your hands in a lot of things. If you guys wanted to stop New York City, you essentially could do it. Oh, without a doubt. I mean, look, you control the Teamsters. You control trucks moving all over the country, goods being shipped all over the country. You call a major Teamster strike. Uh, you cause a lot of damage. You also have, understand this, same thing with the docks. You call a strike on the docks, nothing gets moved in and out of the country. You can cripple the country in that way. Aside from that, just think of the amount of money that those unions had uh, in their pension funds and how valuable that could be to mob-related industry where many guys couldn't go to a bank and get money, but they can go to a Jimmy Hoffa and say, hey, we need X amount of dollars to build a hotel in Vegas. And Jimmy could approve it, and that's it. You got the money. So mm. politicians realize that, too. And that's why they tried to get close to us to get the benefit of what we can do uh, as a result of our controlling the unions. So you control the unions in this country. You control a major part of, uh, of our political landscape as well as a major part of business. I mean, in 2019, is there any criminal element in the Teamsters that you know about, or is it completely legit now? There are still locals that are in some way controlled by the mob, and there will always be that way. Um, as far as, uh, you know, at the top level, I can't talk to, you know, what might be going on at this point in time now. I'll tell you this, I never put it past my former associates to work their way back into this situation. I don't, because they're very, uh, that's what we do. You know, I don't know how the young guys are as capable as guys like us were, but, you know, we had a way to get around people and, and, and do our bidding or have them do our bidding for us. I'll tell you this. I saw The Irishman. I don't know if you've seen it. Scorsese's new film. Uh, not, not yet. I heard it was great. Okay. Right? You know, it, it, it was good. It wasn't epic. It wasn't The Godfather. It wasn't Goodfellas. Or, I, I don't think it was in that level. Uh, and I can tell you that uh, the story was a complete lie. There's no truth to the story. Yes, yeah, certain little things that happened were, you know, 
but Sheerhan did not kill um, Jimmy Hoffa. And that whole thing, it's been, he's been disproved, you know, so often by law enforcement or everybody else. Um, I'm not dissuading people from seeing the movie because it's a movie, it's Hollywood, it's entertainment, but it's not a truthful depiction of what happened. Well, why did you guys hate Geraldo Rivera to the point of almost putting a hit on him? Because he didn't write uh, the truth about us and uh, he wrote about us a lot, you know, and I think after he pulled that stunt with uh, Al Capone's empty safe, uh, people started to think at that point in time, it was great for him. I mean, I think he had 50 million viewers at that time to open an empty safe, but it, it got his name out there. But I think at that point in time, you know, okay, he was a guy that was going after the mob and we don't like him. And he, he wrote some things that just, you know, di or reported some things that just uh, didn't sit well with people. They didn't like him. Well, you dealt with James Comey yourself also? Not personally, but I know he was involved in, in some of the investigations of uh, friends of mine. I don't know if he was involved personally in my investigation or not. Could have been. Uh, I'm not sure. But uh, he had a bad name on the street, framing people and so on and so forth. Um, you know, uh, so I always heard that about him. So you're saying that the guy that ended up being the director of the FBI was framing people? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Comey is, uh, listen, when it came to us, guys would cross the line all the time. I mean, look, I'll tell you this, and I'll tell you this, and, and, and Vlad, I'll take this to my grave, okay? I went to jail for a crime I was guilty of, no doubt about it. I mean, I was in the gas business. I created that scheme. I defrauded the government out of tax on every gallon of gasoline. I pled guilty. That was my crime. My father did a lot of bad things in his life, no doubt about it. Okay, but that particular crime that he did all that time for, my dad was framed. He was no bank robber. He was innocent of that crime. I'll take that to my grave. How do I know that? I investigated that case for over 15 years. We, we spoke to all the witnesses. They told us that the FBI gave them certain dates and times uh, to put, plant my father at a meeting when he wasn't under surveillance. We gave them lie detector tests. We had the driver of the, of the getaway cars, who was the wife of the major um, witness against my father, who said the whole thing was a frame, the whole thing. Gave a lie detector test, took to the Supreme Court. Newsday wrote about it because they, they gave her the lie detector test. We could never get the conviction overturned. So does the FBI, you know, go after people? Some of them, not all of them. Look, I know a lot of good agents too now. You know, in my, in my current life, I've met up with a lot of good people. But they're ones there. When it comes to the mob, or come, yeah, they'll, they'll go outside the law, you know, to try to get somebody and they'll justify it. Well, maybe he got away with a hundred things, so we'll get him on this. Doesn't matter. And Comey was one of those guys. And Comey was one of the guys that was doing it. Absolutely. Okay. Well, at one point, we talked about this in our last interview, you got into the gas business and money started rolling in at a crazy rate. Yes. And you moved down to Miami at some point? Well, I had a house in, uh, in Palm Beach, West Palm Beach, yes. Okay. And you actually got so popular in Miami that you were given a key to the city. Well, that's for a movie that I was producing down there, and I was, I was putting a lot of uh, um, at-risk kids to work in the film. And I, as a, a, uh, a qualification for them working in the film, they had to go to school, they had to do their attendance right, I had to hear back from their teachers, you know. Um, so I put a lot of uh, stipulations on them being involved with the film. So as a result, you know, these kids were going back to school. They were doing the right thing. We were getting praise from the uh, you know, Department of Education, from the teachers. It was great. So the mayor, yeah, he actually gave me a key to the city for, you know, putting people to work and putting the kids back in school and so on and so forth. And we were sincerely doing that. It's kind of ironic, though, when you think about it, that, you know, this captain in, in, a, in the mafia is getting a key to the city in Miami. Well, at the same time, you know, that I was doing that. I was defrauding the government out of, and the state government, too. I had a tax on every gallon of gasoline. So we had two different operations going on. Obviously, the mayor didn't know about that. I felt bad for the guy afterwards because he didn't realize who he was giving the key to the city to. But, uh, yeah, it was one of those ironic things back then. Well, you're making all this money, and the money is illegal. So you have to figure out how to launder that money. Right. 
And you start setting up a system to launder it. And I guess you put some of it in the Cayman Islands. Correct. You put some of it in Austria. And you were, you had it all over the place. What is really, if someone wants to launder money, what really is the process from A to Z in, in order to launder money? Well, you know, the system is a lot more sophisticated now than it was back in my day, I will assume. I'm not laundering money now, so I, I don't have to test it. I don't know. But I've heard from others that it's very difficult now because they have so many checks and balances and so on and so forth in place. But back then, you know, I would run money through five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten different companies and ultimately have it out in Austria um, or the Cayman Islands or other places that we put it. And to bring it back in, you know, we would house money. The reason we did it in Austria because uh, they had no agreement with America. The same with the Cayman Islands, they had no agreement. So I can go to Austria, put $100 million in a bank, take a bank loan back from them. They're really lending me my own money, but it comes to me in the form of a loan. So nobody can say, well, you know, how'd you get the money? Well, they borrowed, I went to Austria and, uh, you know, their uh, uh, credit stipulation is a little different than it is here. I presented a deal to them, I'm building this place, I'm doing that. So they lent me $50 million. So that's one way to launder it, and that's the way we would do it back then. You know, there's various ways now. Um, you know, it's a lot more difficult, like I said, because they have more checks and balances in place, but there's always a way to launder money. Okay, and you had $38 million in an Austrian bank account, you and your partner, and well, I guess each of you had uh, like half of the, the account number? Yeah, it was actually $33 million principal and with interest, you know, it was probably more than that. But we, we put $33 million uh, into that bank account. Yeah. And we each had an, it was a numbered account. So we each had half the number. So we need, we needed each other in order to take that money out. Well, your partner got hemmed up. Yes. And the government wanted that money, but they needed to get you to come up with the other half of the number. Correct. Which ultimately you did. Correct. So the government went in and seized all $38 million, and then that money, I guess, just disappeared. Disappeared. I never got credit for it. Um, I don't know what happened to it. The only way I might have gotten credit for it was an unknown way, meaning that initially the government was looking for a $100 million fine out of me, and they wanted 25 years in prison. We negotiated down to 10 years in prison, and a $15 million fine. And I think the fact that they got that $33 million uh, aided us in the negotiation. But still, it doesn't appear anywhere that I got credit for the $33 million. Nowhere. It's gone. Disappeared. Never, nobody talks about it. Never seen it. Never heard of it. It's gone. So I can't, yeah. I can't answer as to where it went. I know I didn't get it. I'm sure some government official has a nice uh, Swiss bank account somewhere, some property in France and... <laughs> Very possible. Well, at one point you owed the government 103 million and you ended up settling for 250,000. Correct. How does a settlement like that? I mean, when you look at the difference between those two numbers, it's ridiculous. Well, because for 20 years or so they were claiming that I had all this money buried in banks everywhere and that somebody actually wrote a book about, they hired a, an outside firm to investigate it. And so they, they investigated very thoroughly for almost 20 years, you know, to find this money, and they couldn't. And if they did, they couldn't attach it to me. So uh, at the end of the day, you know, you're never going to get it, and you may as well settle for something. But it took 20 years to get to that point. It wasn't like it happened overnight. So, you know, that money, look, I always say this. If there is money out there that people allegedly say was mine, stolen gas tax money, I doubt I'll, if I'll ever get an opportunity to use it, but you know, let's see what happens in the future. I don't know, but uh, I'm not counting on it at this point in time. Can you say how much money you buried at your very height? It was certainly over a hundred million dollars. You had over a hundred million in cash yes. scattered over various bank accounts that you could actually pull out. Yes. And you had a Learjet. Yes. You had a helicopter. Yes. 
What's having a helicopter like? Because you hear of people with private jets, but I've never heard of anyone who owns a helicopter. Helicopter was the best. It was absolutely the best. It was, we had a Bell helicopter. Uh, it was great, you know, at the time when we were picking up money from, um, you know, the various gas stations that we, we operated. Uh, we had a lot of cash in the helicopter at the time. Uh, the FBI could not follow me. They just couldn't. You know, we would take off from Garden City or wherever we had it at the time and go anywhere. And we, I know we drove them crazy because they told me we did afterwards. They could never keep up with us. So it was the greatest tool, especially in a place like New York. We didn't worry about traffic. I used to tease some of the agents because when I was on trial in the Giuliani case, I was living out in Long Island and I would fly in every day uh, to Manhattan. It took me 18 minutes, you know, and I would fly back. So I didn't have to worry about traffic, about getting there and so on and so forth. So I used to tell the agents when we were leaving, I said, you know, got a lot of traffic now. Why don't you jump in a helicopter with me? I'll get you out there, you know, and then, ah, oh, we can't do that. So. You know, I used to tease them about it, but it's the, it was the greatest tool. If I miss anything, I miss the helicopter a lot more than the Learjet. I bet. I don't know anyone who has a helicopter, honestly. I, I can't think of anybody. It was great. <laughs> uh, I think Kobe Bryant had a helicopter. Or at least you take a helicopter to you know to work every day when he was playing for the Lakers. That's oh the yeah, well, heard of. well Kobe lives out by me now in Orange County, so I can see the traffic to getting into L.A., Horrible. So, yeah. as you know, so a helicopter would be exactly. a great tool for him. Betting and gambling was a big part of your business when you were yes. with the Mafia. And in some other interviews, you talked about how you would get sports players to actually fix games when they, were, they would get into gambling problems themselves. So can you yeah. talk about how these things would sort of progress to the point of them actually shaving points? Well, yeah, you know, re remember this. Let's separate the pros from college kids at this point in time. Because back in my day, you know, 70s and 80s, uh, pros weren't making the kind of money that they make today. You know, back then, you know, they made a half a million, a million bucks was a lot of money. But a lot of them gambled heavy. Now, you know, you're making a half a million dollars, you've got a gambling habit, you know, it's not a lot of money, especially the way these guys live. So I want to set that perspective up for you. So, you know, I had, I wasn't in the gambling business myself. In other words, I wasn't a bookmaker, but I had 12, 13 bookmakers that were working under me at that point in time. Now, why did that happen? A couple of reasons. When bookmakers needed money, you know, to finance themselves, I would lend them money. No problem. And secondly, you know, bookmakers take credit. You know, you don't, uh, they take credit. You don't pay in advance. So a lot of times they had collection problems. So they would come to us to help them collect. So a bookmaker always is associated in some way, shape, or form with organized crime if they, if they handle any kind of decent action, right? Okay, so I had all these bookmakers working for me, and they had a lot of athletes gambling with them. Not only athletes, but personnel, you know, involved with the various sports. So I'll give you an example, you know. I would have a bookmaker call me up and say, hey, so-and-so is playing with the Jets, the Mets, whatever team you want, and he's into me for 50 grand. You know, what do you want me to do? You want me to cut them off? And my answer would be, why would you cut them off? You're taking an entry on a piece of paper. Let him get into you for 250 grand, 300, 400, and then bring him to me, and I'll resolve it. And that's what would happen. You know, they'd get in there over their heads. They'd come and see me and say, hey, I guess you didn't know, but, you know, this is my operation. You're gambling with me. So here's the deal. You owe me 250,000. How are you going to pay? Well, I don't have the money right now. Okay, let me tell you something. I'm a big fan of yours. I love the team. I support the team. You don't have to pay me all at once, okay? Pay me five points a week on the 250 in cash every Friday. You bring it here. That's it. And take as long as you want. Well, they'll do that, you know, for um, a period of a time. But what they don't know that I know is that even though we cut them off, they're around town gambling with another bookmaker, thinking they're going to make the money back. So before you know it, they're in debt for five, six, seven hundred thousand. So now I bring them to me after the interest stops. And I said, look, how are you going to pay me back? You got a rich uncle? Go rob a bank. I don't care what you do. Bring me my money. Uh, you know, you see they're scared. So, all right, I got another way to work this out. Here's how we're going to do it. Okay, you're a quarterback. Okay, you're favored to win by 10 points. The first, time, first three times you get the ball, you put it in the hands of the other receiver. Put it in the defensive men's hands. You're a running back. You get the ball. You put it on the ground. First three times. You let me worry about the rest. You're going to do this until I tell you you're not doing it anymore. That's how I'll get my money back. What are they going to do? They're stuck. And they always did that. They, they, they had to. shave points 
in order not to pay back their gambling debt. They had no choice. Either that okay. or, you know, the, the, the threat is we're going to put you in a hospital, you know. And right. I didn't have to say that, but they knew that. Because what I would tell them is a straight out, I says, one thing you don't understand, whether you're here, any city in the, in, in the country, or you're in Vegas, you're going to pay your debt. You're not going to get away with it. You owe a gambling debt you have to pay. And if you don't pay, there's serious consequences. So just work along with us. And that's it. That's all you had to say. Have you ever had to actually hurt a person who didn't want to go along with this? You know situation? what? I pers I'm being honest with you. I personally didn't. And it was very rare that you did because if you get an athlete to work with you two or three games, pretty well you're going to get your money back unless you let them go and get into you for millions, which nobody's going to do. Nobody's going to do because they know at that point there's nothing to gain. Um, but did I hear of, of guys getting hurt? Yeah. But it's, it was okay. rare. I want to be honest because you didn't have to do that. Okay. Now, you don't have to name any names, but these guys that were shaving points, can you tell me the team and the position <laughs> that they played at the time? And, you know, there's multiple quarterbacks, there's multiple running backs. People won't know exactly who we're talking about, but can you tell me the, the team name and the position of these guys that had to shave points for you? You know, I, I, I got in trouble once, okay, when I did an interview for a, a big network, and uh, they tried to get me to do this, and I said, look, I'm not going to name names. It, 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 first of all, it's going to open up a whole big thing. I know as soon as I say somebody, this is going to go wide, and I can't do that. And it's not going to accomplish anything. So uh, let me tell you this. Were the New York teams involved? Yeah. Were there teams around the country involved? Yes. Some people point to games where they can swear that had to be something done. And, you know, in some cases they might be right. You know, it was, it was a little bit obvious. But, um, look, it happens. There's no question about it. And, and it's going to continue to happen. Not as much on a pro level because these guys are making so much money. But, you know, you got to watch out for referees. Let me, let me tell you this. Let me set this up and see if this makes sense to you. you got a referee in an NBA game, okay? you got the Lakers now a favorite to win by 10 points. Favorite to win by 10 points. It's Christmas time. This referee, okay, needs some extra money. Maybe it's something in his family, a sickness or whatever. Maybe he needs a few. Who knows what he might need money for, okay? The Lakers are favored to win by 10 points. Okay, you know this. A referee can call a foul every time these players move down the court, or he doesn't have to call it if he misses it, right? So let's say Lakers are favored to win by 10. He puts a, get, a bet against the spread. Remember, it's the spread. It's not winning or losing. So how does he manipulate that? He puts LeBron James on the bench with two extra, three extra fouls. Keeps him down there three, four, five minutes longer. He does that the same with one or two of their key players. He can manipulate that spread so easily over a period of time that common sense tells you, okay, it could happen. Now, is every referee honest and upright? I'll leave that for you to decide. Okay, so does this happen? Of course it happens. There's too much money in it for it not to happen. Well, in 2007, NBA referee Tim Donaghy was yeah. actually found guilty uh, of gambling that's uh, right. Was he involved with the mafia at all, or that was just personal gambling he was doing? He, he, unwittingly, he was involved. You know, he, uh, well, when I say unwittingly, I don't think he knew the extent of the involvement, but he was involved with a couple of guys that were involved with mob guys. So, um, you know, we don't have to be that overt all the time. There's other guys in between. So, but yeah, I know Tim. You know, we've had many conversations, and uh, you know, look, he was doing what he was doing at that time. He can blame the NBA. I know he blamed the NBA and all of that. And, you know, I'm not going to get into that. And, you know, he has his reasoning for saying what he said. But, um, you know, l l let me tell you this. The problem with these things is that you talk too much. If a referee is doing that on his own, if I was a referee and I had my son, my cousin, my best friend that I trusted more than anything, okay, I would work with that one person. I would never open my mouth. He would know exactly, I would tell him, hey, put a bet on so-and-so, and that's it. End of conversation. And you trust that guy, he's never going to give you up. You know, the problem is when you start talking about it, and you go crazy, and you do it too much, and, you know, that's when you get caught. But if you keep this very close to the vest, it's going to be very hard for you to get caught. Okay, so you actually knew Tim while he was gambling or no, afterwards? No, I knew him afterwards, not while he was gambling. Got it. 
What is different with the Russian mob as opposed to the, the mafia? Well, my experience with them, a uh, couple of things. Number one, they were very bright, very bright. I mean, you know, the, the Russian mob guys that I was dealing with were engineers. Uh, one, uh, you know, had a degree in engineering. He actually, Mike Markowitz, actually invented uh, a taxi meter that was revolutionary at the time that he was selling to, you know, I think Yellow Cab, I don't remember exactly. Very smart guy, number one. Number two, they were not afraid of our justice system here. Some of them had criminal experience back in Russia and going to a prison here in, in uh, you know, uh, the United States would be like a camp to them. So they weren't afraid of our justice system. They were smart and they wanted to make money. And they were used to the black market stuff because in Russia, I mean, I think half the country is run on the black market. So none, none of that worried them. And uh, they were very closed mouth, at least when I deal with them. I got along great with them. They were great partners, great partners. And we made a ton of money together. So, um, and they're a group that I think you, you need, I, I've told people, they're the ones that you need to be concerned with because they know how to move quietly. Um, they'll, they'll, you know, resort to violence if they need to be. And people know that. And they're very smart. You know, and look, I think that I played a role by teaching them how to defraud the government on tax on every gallon of gasoline, I think I taught them how to defraud uh, Medicare and, and our health system because they're into that pretty heavy now from what I understand. And uh, they've made a tremendous amount of money. And I think that I'm the one that showed them target the federal government because they're not too good in their collection, uh, uh, the way they collect money, so. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm Russian myself and you know, my people are not not the most honest. <laughs> I well, could just I could just tell you that I'm not surprised. Well, listen. well the, the basics of the mafia in terms of how they make money is protection, extortion, and gambling. Uh, uh, is that correct? Yeah. You, you wrote that in your book, actually. Yeah, I mean, protection and you know, union involvement at the time. Yeah, I, I think so. Protection, extortion, gambling. Yeah, gambling will always be a major source of income. Always. Okay. What is the protection part? What does that entail? Well, a lot of times you're protecting somebody from your own, you know. The way I got involved in the gas business, very simple. Two guys were extorting Larry Iarizzo, you know that name. They were trying to get involved and get a piece of his company. They were shaking him down. And eventually they would have done that, okay? Threats of violence, the whole thing. Larry came to me to protect me from them. And so I said, okay, if you're with me, nobody's going to bother you except me. So how are we going to make money together? Because what, what uh, benefit of it, uh, is, is it to me to protect you from them if I don't get a benefit out of it? And that's when we started to talk about, you know, defrauding the government. So most of the times you're being protected from our own. Because especially in New York, when there's so many guys, you know, I mean, look, in New York, you stumble over each other. Believe me, so guys were always trying to extort a business or get involved with somebody, and the business owner would run to somebody else for help. Say, okay, I'll help you, but how's it going to benefit me? So that's, that's one way. How does the whole extortion business work? Well, so like I said, let's say uh, the unions were a great tool for us to extort somebody, a business, so on and so forth. Give you an example. Um, let's say there's a restaurant or a club in Manhattan uh, that has a lot of employees, but they're not unionized. Now, I used to uh, control the uh, waitresses and bartenders union. I had a local that I controlled. So we would send body, somebody into uh, a particular restaurant, had a lot of employees, and say, look, um, here's the deal. Uh, we're going to unionize, and they can't stop you from trying to unionize your employees. We're going to start to bring the union in here. You've got 50 employees. You're not, you don't have a union, and... That's not fair to your workers. We're going to bring the union in. They don't want that, obviously. Um, but I said, here's the deal. If you don't want the union, every Christmas I want you to give me $20,000. You do that, I'll keep the union out. That's a form of extortion, really. You know, because you're threatened of doing something and, you know, for getting money in return. So that's extortion. So, um, you know, and we use the unions a lot to operate in that way. A lot. Um, you know, same thing with Jerry Gutterman. So let's say, um, you know, we use the unions were a major tool for us to extort a business. 
give you an example. I had under my control uh, a major um, apartment to co-op conversion. It was a major one. It was in Queens, New York. It was the biggest one in the country. We converted uh, 3,500 apartments into co-ops at the time. The union was going in to unionize the, every trade in there. It would have cost the, uh, the, the, uh, the builder, the owner rather, uh, at least another $25, $30 million to do the job if we had the union in there because it was a huge job. So I had somebody in there that was um, uh, working under them. He was kind of a contractor in there. And I had him go speak to the owner and say, look, I have a contact and he can keep the union out. Talk to him. So I sat down with Gutterman at the time. We made a deal. I said, I'm going to keep the union out basically, but you're going to use my general contractor from this point on. The only way I can keep the union out is by me being in control of your contracting here. And you're going to pay me X amount of dollars every quarter. So I got paid from him for keeping the union out to a large degree. Plus, I made money by having my general contractor in there uh, to run the job. Saved him a lot of money. I made a lot of money. Everybody was happy. But it is a form of extortion. Oh, yeah, that's definitely extortion. Now, in your book, you talked about how Machiavelli uh, was like a cornerstone in terms of how the mafia operated. Yes. And this was a, you know, a central figure during the Italian Renaissance. Uh, he wrote this book called The Prince that would help you know, leaders in his country uh, rule. And it's interesting because uh, this was also a book that Tupac was heavily influenced by when he was in prison. And when he came out, his last album, he actually changed his name to Machiavelli. Really? I didn't know that. Smart oh, yeah, guy. Yeah, Tupac, yeah, Tupac's last album was under the Machiavelli name as opposed to the Tupac name. But you talked about how the Machiavellian principle is really not a very good principle in terms of how to live your life. And can you explain that? Well, yeah, and Machiavelli was kind of the patron saint of the mob. When you went into prison, it was almost required reading that you read The Prince. And just to explain, The Prince, um, in The Prince, Machiavelli is supposed to consult or guide The Prince and give him guiding principles on how to maintain control of his country, of his leadership. And one of the main principles was this. He told the prince that you could do anything that you need to do. You can lie, you can steal, you can cheat, you can kill. You can do anything you need to do to maintain power because that's the major goal, maintain power and control over your kingdom. But in doing so, you must always appear to the outside person to be upright, to have integrity, and to be honest. And that's the Machiavellian way. The end justifies the mean, anything goes, but you have to appear to be upright, honest, and have integrity. And to a large degree, you know, with certain things, that's how the mob operated. We got what we want. The end justifies the means. As long as we get what we want in the end, well, we're supposed to do it in a way that shows that we have honor and integrity and honesty among one another. So that's it. Now, is that a good way to live? Of course not, because it, it, it has no restrictions on you. As a matter of fact, Machiavelli, it says it's better okay, for you to have no, no restrictions on you, because then you can do anything that you want, as long as you appear to have restrictions on you in that way, morally. So is it a good way to live? Of course not, because then anything goes. You can lie, you can steal, you can cheat, you can do anything that you want um, in order to maintain control and to get what you want. So obviously it's not a good way to live, and in the end, you're going to fail as a result of that. Well, you talked about how fear is a major emotion in mafia life. But at one point, the government became more feared than the other mob guys. Well, that's what happened. You know, in, in the mid-80s, when they started to use the racketeering laws, when they started to use the Bail Reform Act, you got no bail if you were a danger to community uh, or you were a flight risk, you know, and, and anybody can be a danger to community. If you're in the mob, you're automatically a danger to community. So they used that to hold you without bail. Very difficult to fight a case from inside you know, rather than when you're outside and you can do it, you know, along with your, uh, your representation. So they used all of these tools to make the government more feared than the mob. Now, what do I mean by that? Racketeering laws, you get convicted of one count of racketeering, you can go away for 20 years. You don't get parole anymore, meaning you have to do 17 and a half on the 20. Way back when, uh, Vlad, 
you know, anybody can do. You get 10 years, you get 15 years, okay. You get parole, you do seven and a half, you do nine, you 10. Anybody can do that. Today, what they did with those racketeering laws, they say, you get convicted, you're going to wait for the rest of your life. That's it. Unless you want to talk to us. You want to talk to us, we'll put you in a program, we'll give you a cushiony deal, and you'll get out, we'll change your name, give you some money, and we'll preserve your life. A lot of guys did not stand up over that. And there was a talk at the time that it was all the young guys that weren't standing up. That's not true. There was a lot of old timers that went, uh, you know, Joey Messina. Joey Messina, the boss of, uh, of, the, of the family, okay? He got, I, I think, 300 years. He made a deal after he was convicted, when he was inside, because you don't want to do that kind of time. It's a whole different mindset. So, you know, that's what really, when you, you give any one reason for the mob's demise, that's the reason. The racketeering law and guys on the street became more afraid of the government and doing that kind of time than they did the guys on the street. They just transferred the fear to the government. Yeah, it makes sense. It makes sense. Now, in our last interview, you talked about how you knew Sammy the Bull. Yes. Uh, and this guy, he admitted to 15 murders? He admitted to 19 murders. 19 murders. Okay. How close were you to Sammy? I wasn't close to him. I knew him, you know, I was closer to John Gotti. Uh, and I wasn't, uh, you know, I can't say John and I hung out. We were friends. We had a couple of business dealings. They were actually disputes. And we hung out socially at times. I met John. So, uh, and I like his family a lot until today. Okay, he's got a, he's got a good family. Um, Sammy, I knew, you know, we bunked into him in weddings and so on and so forth. And I met him on occasion, met him with John, uh, but we weren't close. Did you know Richard, uh, Kuklinski, the Iceman? I did not, no. And a lot of, a lot of that was blown up quite a bit with Kuczynski, believe me. Okay. How many guys did you know that were like Sammy that really just liked killing people? that really were serial killers? Well, look, I knew the DeMeos, I knew Roy DeMeo, and you know, they had that reputation. They were the guys that did a lot of work. Um, you know, a guy like Greg Scarpa, who, you know, used to claim he enjoyed to do that kind of work. So I knew Greg well, he was, he was with us, you know, with the Columbos. You know, Persico had that reputation too. So, uh, you know, and they presented themselves that way, so. You know, I guess I knew a lot of guys like that. Look, um, you know, at least outwardly presented themselves as whether they enjoyed it or not. Now, I heard a recent interview with Sammy where uh, he was asked, you know, you know, com you committed 19 murders. And Sammy said, well, how do you know how I felt, you know, when I committed those murders? And he, he, he said he felt bad about it. He actually stated that, you know, he stood in front of the coffin at a funeral or a wake, I would say, of one guy that he murdered, and he was actually mentally yelling at the guy, saying, look what you made me do. You violated the rules, and you made me kill you. He actually, if that's not Machiavellian, I don't know what is, but he actually turned it on the guy that he killed and blamed him for having Sammy kill him. And I want to say, did you do that 19 times, Sammy? But anyway, um, but look, I don't know. I mean, you know, I don't know if Sammy enjoyed it or not. I can't get inside of his head, but 19 murders is a lot of murders. Well, yeah, I just interviewed, uh, you know, I'd mentioned him before, Brian Glaze Gibbs. He talked about, in our interview, about six different people that he killed, including two women. Wow. And at the end of the interview, I talked about how he doesn't seem very remorseful. Uh, you know, I've interviewed a number of people that have committed murder through various means. Uh, you know, one guy, there was a home invasion. He ended up killing the guy, and he was, like, literally crying as he was describing it. Um, you know, and another guy ended up killing his uh, daughter's uncle over, a, over an argument, and then, you know, he talked about how he messed his whole life up. This guy really just calmly talked about all the various people he killed. And... Uh, it's interesting how a lot of people, especially once you start doing it over and over again, it just doesn't become a big deal anymore. It's just something you do. It's part of your job. You're telling me this story. There's not a lot of emotion and, and that's you know, coming with this. And you know what? It's like right now, 
yeah, years. This is something that I've been battling with for my life. This is something I've been battling with over 30 years. The key is right now is this, like I tell you right now is, I don't have to put on a scene or front and like, you know, light, camera, action, and you see tears. The bottom line is right now, if you see some of my other interviews, like right now is, when certain things hit you, it's not an act. You come with it. And to me, regardless of what, like I say, only thing I got is my word. As far as like my action, my behavior, I'm very, you know what I'm saying, remorseful for that. Because once again, who am I to say who live and who died, Vlad? I'm not God. I fucked up. And I can admit that. And this, like I say, throughout my years, I've been beating up myself for over 30 years based upon my behavior. So with these guys or whatever, you know what, you know, like, you know, like comparison, there's no comparison. Everybody react differently or whatever. When we start sitting back talking about it or whatever, even right now, I got a clip I wish I can give you from inside of mine or kill or whatever. When I start talking about I stole these people legacy. I took moms away. I took, you know what I'm saying? Come on, who am I to say who lived and who died? So I don't got to pretend with you. That's not what this is all about. The whole key, if I had a chance to do it all over again, or if I can trade my life for their life, guess what? We wouldn't even be here. You know, I, I think some people do view it that way. Uh, unfortunately, um, I've met people that have spoke to me that way. And, you know, during my time in that life, hey, you know, it's a job. We do it and that's it. To me, it's a horrible thing, uh, Vlad. I, I can't see it that way. Unfortunately, I've been around people that, you know, I cared about that were gone the next day that were murdered and it was, it was difficult to deal with. Look, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, say that I'm not capable of it. Obviously, I am. If somebody hurt my, my wife, children, people that I love, uh, but I certainly wouldn't be joyous about it. I wouldn't go on and talk about it. I don't, it's, it's an uncomfortable topic for me, and I think it should be for most people, but unfortunately, it's not that way. And there are people that just, it's, it's another thing in life. And, um, you know, it's tough to, to know that, but it's true. You know, in your book, when, you know, you apply some of the mafia principles to business, you said something interesting. You said, mobsters do one thing which might also be worth emulating. They like to keep things simple, to cut to the chase. As a result, they're good at eliminating the clutter that they can get in the way of productive endeavors. They try to create a clear and easy path uh, from where they are to the money. Lay out your business plan and then find ways to get to where you want to be with as little friction as possible. I thought that was interesting. Uh, describe like during the mafia times when you would, you know, get rid of the clutter in order to get to the money. Well, you know, I mean, look, these are not, these are not brain surgeons, guys on the street, you know, I mean, uh, and, and I'm not demeaning anybody, but I mean, when it comes to business, a lot of guys were just not that you know, uh, equipped to deal with things, you know, it's a straight line to the money. How do we get it? You know, that's it. So, I mean, I can't describe a particular case because my mindset was a little different, although, um, you know, I, I am that way. You know, I want to get to the bottom line as quickly as I can and as easy as I can. I don't think I can describe something um, in particular at this point in time, but, you know, in the gas business, you know, when Lyra Rizzo was explaining things to me, I said, look, this is complicated. Tell me how do we get from A to Z really quickly? What do we have to do? Let's set up a system that gets the money to us as quickly as possible so that we can put it where we need to put it and use it the way we need to use it. And we devised a scheme without getting into the detail uh, that allowed us to do that. You know, so... Um, but, you know, people today in business, I understand when I sometimes people sit down, they, they give me all these compu complicated ways that they're going to make money and and uh, they don't really know what they're doing or what they're describing. Um, so I don't know. Like I said, I can't give you some particular instances right now, but it's just that's how mob guys are. You know, hey, if there's money in that room, how do we break the safe open and get to it? You know, if there's money in that business, how do we get everybody out of the way and steal it? And that's it. And that's how we talked about it. And you got to get a particular place. And I, and I would tell you how we did it. Well, you know, you talked about in one of your books that you said, there's no doubt in my mind that many of the mob bosses who were successful in organized crime would have been uh, equally as successful as CEOs. Oh, no doubt. My, my father, I think, could have been a, a successful guy. He, he had a good mind. Persico was a very smart guy. If he would have put his talent in another way, I think so. I mean, just, you know, un unfortunately, these were guys on the street. 
you know, I, I don't I wouldn't necessarily say that about John Gotti. I don't think he was uh, he had a good grasp of business. Um, Sammy, obviously, he was a good businessman, you know, and, and, and people knew that he was smart in that regard. Uh, so there were a lot of guys that were successful uh, on the street that if they would have put their talents legitimately, I think they would have done well. Now, that's not the uh, that's not the rule. A lot of guys on the street that they just couldn't earn any kind of money anyway. We had, we had to support them. So um, there is a definite separation there. Look, the reason that they kept me where they kept me because I had a head for business. I was able to earn for the family. And therefore, a lot of the grunt work, a lot of the other work, they didn't want that from me. No, you keep bringing money into us. We'll let these guys that are doing nothing that we're supporting, let them do the heavy work in that regard. And, you know, that's kind of the distinct, the, excuse me, the distinction in that life. And you, you talked about in that same passage that these mob bosses, they're required to live a lifestyle where every day, you know, presents a challenge just to survive, where every friend is your potential enemy, where a board meeting just might prove to be your last encounter on earth. And, and that really kind of puts it in perspective as someone who has a company and has company meetings and so forth. I don't look at the people around me, okay, if this meeting goes bad, I might get killed <laughs> the next day. So it's not quite as serious to me as I'm speaking, but I guess in order to keep this type of organization where, yeah, these guys might all turn against you, whether they want your spot or whether they're working with the police and so forth, you actually have to be respectful, you have to be polite, and you have to really use these principles to a very elevated degree or else things might go really bad really quickly. And I can see how that could apply to a regular business as well. Vlad, there's always somebody in the room uh, that either wants what you have, that doesn't like you, that's trying to undermine you or would undermine you in some way if they could. Uh, I don't care if it's your best friend or you think it's your best friend. You know, that's the nature of that life. You always have to be aware of who you're dealing with. And, and you know, that life is like a wheel. It turns. You know, the guy that's on the bottom today could be your boss or could be on the top, you know, the next day. So you always had to be very careful, uh, you know, who you might offend, um, you know, who you might say something wrong about. And I think a lot of times in business, it's the same way. You know, people resent you if you're the owner. You know, they, you know, people that work with you, look, it's happening in our government. You know, people are resentful for Trump for whatever reason. They may be right, they may be wrong. I don't know. But he's got people around him all the time he's got to be aware of and, and who may undermine him. It's the same thing in business. You know, somebody wants your spot. Somebody wants to make a little money. Somebody's resentful of what you did. And you, you, you try your best not to give them an opening. Now, I've seen that in business many times. I've seen people try to, you know, undercut and undermine. I have pe people come to me that are working you know, for their boss that are looking to, to steal money from them. That happened to me a, a quite a bit, you know, when I was on the street. So, um, you know, you, you just got to be very skillful in how you deal with people, very guarded, no matter what, I think, no matter what lifestyle you're in. I agree. I agree. I've had people within my own company that try to destroy the company from within, uh, unsuccessfully. <laughs> but... It's crazy how you're paying a person and yet they're trying to hurt you as they're being paid. It's kind of a crazy concept, but at least they weren't trying to kill me, but it's the same type of thing. Exactly. In our life, you can get killed. Listen, you know I'm a person of faith now. There's no uh, hiding that. I've seen it happen in the church where people, and it's happened many times, where churches split because one is undermining the pastor and so on and so forth. It happened in my own family with, uh, with my wife's brother. So, I mean, it's human nature. So you, whatever it is that you're doing, you have to be guarded. On the street, it's more serious because if you offend somebody, you do something wrong. Like Paul Castellano, he didn't have a lot of people like him because they thought he was greedy. He, wasn't, he didn't make people around him make money. So you give a guy like that or somebody an opportunity you know, to undermine you or to take you out, you're going down. That's why when Gotti took out Castellano, there weren't a lot of people crying over it because he wasn't well liked for that reason. You know, so um, and 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 if there were a lot of people crying, uh, crying about it, Gotti would have paid the price, but he didn't. And I think that's the reason. Well, there's a saying that the only way to leave the mafia is in a coffin. You left the mafia how many years ago? 
I consider myself formally removed in, in really in the late 90s, 95, 96. 20, almost 25 years. In the beginning, you talked about how you didn't put any of the bills in your name, you didn't go to any clubs, you didn't go to the same restaurants, you wouldn't walk your dog, and so forth. And you actually had to evacuate your house because there was a tip that someone might try to kill you yeah. in the beginning. Do you still feel that way in 2019? You know, uh, I don't. Um, you, you know, I want to make this clear. I never lived in fear when I left that life. I was always cautious. I was disciplined in how you know, I, I went about my, my daily life because I had to be. I didn't sell my former associates short, especially Persigo. He was a very capable guy, very upset when I walked away from the life, and obviously he put the contract out on me. Had Persigo been on the street and not in prison, I probably would have had a real problem because I don't think he would have he would have ever given up. He would have been relentless in coming after me until the job was done. So it would have had to be me or him or something would have had to been done. I, I really believe that until today. Uh, but that didn't happen. So, and remember this, I think I described it last time. I was walked into a room one night when I was in that life and I didn't think I was gonna walk out again. And unfortunately, one of the, the horrors of that life is you make a mistake, your best friend walks you into a room, you don't walk out. And I've, obviously I witnessed that in my lifetime. So I realized that I could face death. I faced death at one point in time. And whether it be my perception or not, I was scared that night. I thought I was gonna get killed. And yet I walked into the room. So, and people said, well, man, that was very heroic. It wasn't heroic, it was robotic. I was such a product of the life and I had known that, hey, if this is it, this is it, you know? And I was scared, I'm not gonna deny it. I was scared walking in that room. When that door opened, I, I, I don't know how I didn't faint, because when you think you're going at that moment, it's, it's pretty scary. So I took that with me, I took that feeling with me, and I said, well, if they're going to come and get me, they're not walking me into a room, they're going to have to work to get me. And so I, I protected myself as best way I know how, you know, Vlad, so I never lived in fear. And I also knew that, you know, I had the ability to retaliate. If somebody was going to go one-on-one -on -one with me, they better be prepared. And I, you know, I, 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 was, I was very mindful of that. Now, do I feel that way today? No. I mean, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not going to go back into Brooklyn and say, hey, guys, I'm moving back into the neighborhood. I wouldn't last 48 hours. But I'm not going to thumb my nose in anybody's face. So, you know, is the heat off of me? Yeah. I mean, look, I didn't put anybody in prison. I did not put anybody in prison. I did not cooperate against my former associates. Yes, I talked to the government. Yes, I talk about that life. But I never wanted to hurt anybody. I never wanted to put anybody. I wasn't mad at anybody. I wanted out of the life for other reasons. So I think all of those things, you know, and of course, because I'm a person of faith, I think, you know, God had a different purpose for my life. It's become obvious, you know, with what I've been doing for the last 23 years. So I do not live in fear. And, uh, and hopefully it'll continue like that. And, you know, I don't know. I could walk out of here and somebody's going to put a bullet in my head waiting for me. I mean, is that possibility there? Yeah. And remember this. You know, I, I do big speaking events. I have hundreds of people online, you know, waiting to sign a book for me to sign a book and say hello and take a picture. I don't know who everybody is on that line. Now, sometimes there's security there. A lot of times there is. A lot of times there isn't. So who knows? Maybe some guy wants to make a name for himself, you know, and, uh, and, and be a hero and come up to me and I'm gone. I don't know. Do I fear it? No. Am I mindful of it? Yeah. Every day, and I'm not kidding whether it be online or whatever, people are asking me for advice, personal advice, how to run their life, because they say, if I can survive in this life after the things that I did, maybe it could, you know, it could be helpful to them. So I've been kind of like a personal life coach for the last 20 some odd years, and the same thing in business, because I had success on the street, and I have some success now. I'm actually going formally into the coaching arena, so to speak. And I'm going to be announcing that fairly soon. We've built the website, going to build a company on it. Uh, I just wanted to mention that. So we're going to be putting it out there. And it's something I enjoy doing. I like helping people, encouraging people, giving them whatever advice they can at some point in time. I wanted to mention it because people will have access to me in that regard. 
And just look, right after the holidays, we'll be making an announcement about that and about that rat. And uh, hopefully, it'll it'll work out for not only myself but for everybody else involved and interested. Well, Michael Franzis, appreciate you coming in now for the second time. Uh, congratulations on turning your life around. Uh, you're very much in the minority uh, of people who came from that life who are not dead or doing life in prison. And, uh, you know, not only did you turn your life around, but you're not in protective custody. You're not hiding somewhere. You didn't get plastic surgery <laughs> and, you know, trying to distance yourself. You actually embraced who it was that you are. You took responsibility for it. You didn't talk about how much of a victim you were and how the government was out to get you the whole time. Uh, you owned your mistakes and you're using them to better your future. And I think that's something that everyone should applaud. Well, I appreciate that, Val. And, and uh, you know, I, I, I thank you for giving me the opportunity to come and speak. And you've been a great uh, interviewer. And uh, anytime we can do this, you know, I'll make myself available. So thanks a lot. Absolutely. Until next time. Peace. Take care.